Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Hope for Healthcare with Dr. Katie Cole in partnership with ICD Healthcare Network. Dr. Katie Cole is a holistic physician, organizational well being consultant, and change agent, working with industry leaders and in proven strategies to heal our national healthcare system and our culture of medicine. Stay tuned to hear today's speaker. Welcome everyone to Hope for Healthcare. This is a podcast in which we interview expert leaders around the country on best practices for healing our national healthcare system and our culture of medicine. Today, I want to extend a very warm welcome to my colleague, Dr. Robin Geiger. Dr. Geiger is an accomplished, results-driven, board-certified nurse executive with over 20 years of hands-on clinical leadership experience. Dr. Geiger's professional focus is on health equity and clinician advocacy with a goal of increasing resilience for healthcare providers, improving quality care, and creating solid support systems through the ACT program, Advocacy Career and Tools, for all clinicians within Ingenovus Health. She has served as Associate Dean of Academic Affairs for National University, Vice President of Care and Clinical Services, and Chief Privacy Officer for Muscular Dystrophy Association and Head Nurse for Veterans Affairs Community Care. She has published numerous articles, book chapters, continuing education courses, and presented on multiple healthcare topics. She is passionate about clinician advocacy, health equity, DEI, and mentorship. Well, welcome, Dr. Geiger. We're so happy to have you on the podcast today. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Dr. Cole, for having me. Absolutely. Well, can you tell us a little bit about your own journey with healthcare burnout and how you became interested in being a leader and champion for clinician well-being? Sure, I can tell you um, burnout has been around as long as I've been when I started my career. I started my career as an intensive care unit nurse at the bedside. Um, So of a level one trauma center, very intense. Um, Right away, I I knew that I love nursing, but that I could do more. Um, Always pushing to find out what I can do to improve on any challenges that I found. Um, I can tell you, though, that I didn't pay much attention to burnout for myself. I didn't pay attention to self-care or awareness. Um, And it wasn't really a topic uh, that many years ago. I, I'm going to date myself if I tell you how many. Um, but now with the hindsight that I have, um, with the retrospective look over the years of my career in each of those different lanes or avenues that I chose, there's always been challenges for nurses or clinicians or frontline healthcare providers. And, you know, just those challenges not being addressed or being smoothed out a little bit, but not really a process created to identify how to address these challenges. And it it wasn't really, you know, pinpointed as burnout until most recently. Um, I think even the World Health Organization now has an ICD for Mm -hmm. clinician burnout. It's definitely, it's time to put it as a four, um, put it in the forefront as something important because if we don't take care of our clinicians, then it decreases access to care. Um, you know, it, there's mm. risk for client safety, patient safety. So it was a passion of mine when um, I, I saw that there was a need at Ingenivis for us to really address that, to support clinicians, to be advocates, to lend them our voice. And so I, I'm really excited to lend them mine. Oh, great. Well, you certainly have a very extensive background and I'm excited to, you know, get into the nuts and bolts of our discussion about um, what you're doing with Ingenovus, Ingenovus Health. Did I say that right? <laughs> Ingenovus. You okay. Good. All right. Good. Um, so you have something that we've talked a little bit about is your ACT program. And it's a program that you've developed where you really empower clinicians and you promote well-being within your own system and you help to buffer burnout through that. I'm curious to learn more about how um, that program is set up and run. Well, the ACT program is unique to Ingenivus. Um, this was a concept developed before me, um, but I, I'm lucky enough that they chose me to develop the program, to really put some onus into it and blend our company of brands. I mean, we have seven different companies within Ingenivus. 
So it, it's actually a nice support network for all of the companies. Mm -hmm. um, so ACT stands for advocacy, career, and tools. And those three pillars divide into different methods and uh, ways that we support clinicians. Um, now, the ACT program, before I, before I even came to be within Genevis, um, they researched what nurses needed, what clinicians needed. They wanted to find out more about what was happening at the bedside, why people were leaving the profession. Um, and they found by utilizing that voice of the clinician, answering what they wanted, they had to do more than just give them free or discounts or, you know, um, maybe nice giveaways. You've been there. I'm sure, you know, as nurses, clinicians, doctors, we've been given, um, you know, rewards, incentives, but nothing that is actually a sustainable answer to helping, you know, mitigate burnout. And the ACT program does that. So um, within advocacy, we lead our voice politically as well as just being there for the clinician and speaking for them, making sure that they're safe. We, we definitely look at clinician safety, develop the clinician safety program within our company so that we're supporting our clinicians at the bedside. Um, and as far as career, definitely making sure that there were career opportunities. We've partnered with universities to make sure that they have more affordable options for attaining or going back for um, advancing their education. Um, also, we have been able to partner and provide continuing medical education um, credits for physicians, um, as well as our nurses. Um, so making sure that there's some career pathing that they have that support. Um, we even developed uh, roles, clinician engagement partner um, within our ACT program. They're there to support the clinicians, making sure that if they want to advance their degree, that they can kind of guide them and give them a pathway to what it looks like, what's required. Um, so there's so many different aspects within these pillars, but I'm, I'm just touching on a few to highlight. Um, and then tools, we developed um, you know, a, a nurse toolkit that helps them with, in their travels from, you know, um, different areas within the U.S., different states, things to do, um, information on getting licensed or, or advancing their license into other states, um, and then also providing them a huge network of self-care awareness tools. Um, we have a webinar series that we started that is it's just taken off with just a huge impact to many around us, clinicians. And I'm, I'm finding that um, more so there's faculty members that are attending, there are retirees that are attending our webinars, everyone's starting to get involved and, inter um, and interested in self-care and they understand how important it is. Um, and then within those tools, we partnered with um, other third parties um, to provide them um, mindful practices and meditation and mobile apps and apps that can help them and provide those tools that they can utilize at the bedside. Quick wins to help them, remind them that self-care is super important. Um, and of course there's a mental health safety and awareness that's involved. Um, mental health is huge. Um, just from the media, I'm, I'm sure that you know, there's so many, there's been so many things happening where nurses, physicians, um, that they're leaving their profession because they just can't take it anymore. So with burnout, there's this huge mental health awareness. That's, that's something that's a necessity in order to address. So hopefully I didn't bore you with the, the, the huge details, but there's so much more I could talk about it all day. Um, it's, oh, yeah. working, it's working <laughs> wonders and it's really an industry movement. It's more of a, a mm -hmm. culture within something that we can share within our company brands to make sure that all of our clinicians are happy, they're supported and that they, they stay within our company brands and they feel that there's, they feel self of, um, self like that they're involved, um, onus into what they're doing. They feel like they have a community. So it's, it's working out great. And I'm, I'm just really glad to lead it. 
Yeah, well, Robin, I mean, you've 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 mentioned so many different pearls in what you just <laughs> the ACT program that that really do help to buffer burnout. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I'm curious to know a little bit more about is the advocacy aspect of the ACT, ACT program. Can you give us an example of how you're able to advocate for your clinicians on the front line? Absolutely. So we've created an internal network, uh, an internal process. So to so because we have we have more than one company, we have seven. So within all of our company brands, we've created a network so that if there is a clinician that's put in harm's way, um, if there is an active shooter, if there's anything that happens, they will refer that clinician to our clinician engagement partners and um, my team, and we can connect with them and do a warm connection so that we can find out, are you okay? What can we provide you? What resources do you need? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm going to be honest, that never happened to me um, in my career as far as if I had been exposed to trauma or even if th there was just a, a risk if you deal with it, you have maybe a 15 minute conversation on a Zoom or in a large group, mm -hmm. but no one checks in on you to see how you really are doing. No one, you know, just kind of really connects one on one with you. And we're doing that. And it's it's just amazing. Um, I've had a lot of great feedback on this from our clinicians and from our internal partners. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, and, and that is so important, Robin, and that goes to building, you know, we, we talk about changing a culture and culture transformation, and part of that change is developing psychological safety and trust within an organization and creating a culture of psychological safety and trust. So I feel like from what you're saying that the advocacy portion of your program is really helping to transform your culture and your organization and moving in the right direction, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we want to we want to do more than just make sure that nurses have the career opportunities um, and that, that we're speaking for them. We also want to hear back from them. We want that raw feedback. I mean, how are you doing? What can we do to make things better? We say that we're asking those questions, but sometimes we're not really looking at the results or or the information that we're getting back. And I feel with the ACT program, we're really doing that. We're really kind of I say it all the time, but we're, we're, you know, walking the talk, we're backing it up. Mm -hmm. And I love that. And that was a really good way to not only show the clinicians that we hear you, but actually that we support you. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned taking that feedback and then implementing changes based on that feedback mm -hmm. is key. And it sounds like you've built that feedback loop, the feedback mm -hmm. loop into your system. We have, and I love that. And it took uh, it took a while. Um, I'm going to be honest. We've done quite a bit of work in the last few months, but mm -hmm. everyone just stepped up, and they knew that this was a calling, something that was required to make sure that we retained our clinicians in the professions, and that they really were okay. And you know, ultimately, that we're providing safe patient care because our patients um, mm -hmm. feel like they're important and they're taken care of and the attention is on them. And that can happen when our clinicians feel better taken care of and that they feel better supported. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so I, you know, we've talked a little bit about the ACT program. Are you measuring what you're doing so you can track over time how it's impacting your clinicians? Absolutely. Sure. Um, so we started uh, the, the program development for the ACT program started in November. So it's not quite a year and we've made this huge transformation and a lot of progress. But yes, we did early in the process before they started. They, they researched and did surveys, um, made sure that they heard from within their internal networks and company brands what the needs were. And then we did also a, another brand awareness survey. You know, are you even familiar with ACT program? Because be, to be honest, you know, sometimes we, we make a lot of implementations in different organizations, but it's really getting it out there. Everyone's so busy making sure you go back and, hey, do you know that we're doing this? Hey, do you know that this is here for you? So we're doing that very often. And we've even created um, 
a chief nurse advisory board, which was, that was a huge undertaking. Um, so we have representation, it's an interdisciplinary board. We have an, an MD and a nurse and a dean. And just, we wanted to make sure that we got a global voice so that we could hear what's happening out there in, the, in these different health systems and universities and bring that back in. So we have this continuous feedback loop that's really working to make sure that we understand what we're doing, if if there's value to it, um, what's our attrition and retention look? What does that look like for us? Um, how you know how are they? How are they feeling when they utilize some of the services? Those are the questions that we're asking right now, and really interested to hear and to just take a look in a year's time, which is what two months in November when it's been full development, just to look back and and everything that we've done the voice that we've gotten from that to make sure that we're sustaining the right programs. So we definitely have our eyes in the right place. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it sounds like it. And congratulations for getting this, you know, up and running in the past year. That's definitely something to be commended. Thank you. <laughs> that's yes. pretty fast with timelines. So that's <laughs> wonderful. It is, it is, but everyone's <laughs> been amazing um, from our CEO through um, our clinician engagement partners, our marketing team, everyone's been all in and that's what it takes. It it takes a village. You hear that all the time, but it's true, yeah, it's true. It's <laughs> to make better. things happen, right? Well, and having your leadership team on board and dedicated to right. clinician well-being, I think is huge. I think that's a game changer for any organization. So um that's great to hear that's why I'm interviewing you today on the podcast <laughs> thank you absolutely thanks for having me um well I'm I'm curious do you have um can you give us an example of maybe one factor that has really helped your retention with your clinicians in your organization what's been a big impact for you that way well looking forward to metrics that we will be attaining, what I anticipate that we will see is that we'll see that they feel more belongingness, um, that, that they feel more inclusivity. We actually, we're, we're definitely, we, we have a DEI manager who's working closely with all of us as well. So there's different different subgroups. And um, speaking of committees and subgroups, we also have um a committee, they're called ACT Concept Engineers, where we have representation from every single company brand. We meet together and we're all working together to blend those voices from all of these companies. What's happening to clinicians that are working with you? What do you see in the field? What do you think they need? So what I anticipate is that, number one, the feedback so far is that they're loving the ACT program. Um, they like the fact that they have a, a self um some self-governance and a feeling of belongingness. They have, um, we've actually been doing, we did uh, a, um, we did nurse night out. We've been doing some other engagements to increase clinician engagement as well, to make sure that, they, that they're being social because when they travel, usually of course they're traveling alone um, and when they're going to these different places, um, it may be a little bit more challenging for them to, to blend. So they don't have to feel like they're alone because we're always there with monthly webinars and opportunities to engage and talk. Mm -hmm. So I, have a, I, I can already see that there is um, not just retention is going to be improved, but also referrals I think will, will improve is along the way. And I'm excited to see that. Well, that's great. And I know, you know, one of the things that we've talked about, um, you and me in our previous discussion, as well as nationally, is the importance of transparency with leadership. You know, that's part of and the foundation of wellness centered leadership. And it sounds like, you know, your act program <clears throat> is building in a platform to have transparency where you're able to share with your clinicians changes that you're making. Um, what else? Are you, can you talk a little bit about your town halls? I I would, I'm really curious. Hey, okay. I love that you call them town halls. Okay. And, and they are town halls, I would say, but, um, so this definitely isn't me. This, this is our executive leadership team. Um, our CEO speaks at these town halls, but so, I mean, we definitely do updates. I've spoken at quite a few of them. Um, anything that's really impactful that's happening, like high on our priority list, um, they're very transparent with everything that's happening, when it's happening. Mm -hmm. And the town halls pulls 
everyone together under that one umbrella, just to talk about, to hear transitions um, in different organiz uh, in different companies, whether, you know, we're cha doing a brand renovation or a brand transition or update um, act programs along the way. I think that the town halls really gave us the win that we needed in our sale to get where we're going in the act program, because you do have the COO, uh, Lori Reichardt, and you have Bart Valdez, our CEO, CEO speaking. Uh, about the ACT program you, in their podcasts um, when they're talking in different um, meetings and events and presentations. We're all sharing what we're doing. Um, so another thing that I love is it's not just the town hall. Um, you know, we're definitely posting, we have a newsletter that's internal and we're posting information there. So some people, you know, we can catch in different methods, right? Um, not everyone can attend the town hall, but maybe someone can read the newsletter. And then the group that we have in our ACE concept um, engineer committee, they report out to every single company brand what the ACT program is doing, um, different webinars, what's coming up, um, if we're having a challenge or if we think that there's uh, clinicians are having a challenge in a certain area, we can all decide together what's best as far as creating these, these sustainable program options. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, I would say I'm most proud that I am within an organization that has these town halls and that transparency, but it's a continuous uh, cycle of transparency that we're building in all of the company brands and then blending our uh, among each other when we create committees or events. Um, it's, it's really, it's just really, I would say it's inspiring to see um, and I've been in lots of different you know, nonprofit, federal and public sector, but it's inspiring to see a family. Um, and that's what in Genevis kind of feels like. It feels more like a family. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's how you're describing it. Definitely. Yeah. And I think the open communication, the transparency, um, <clears throat> and then offering the multiple different ways of, of communication. I think that's really key to success of any kind of well-being program being implemented. And, you know, we all take in information differently. So it sounds like you guys are really um, aware of that and that people have learning, you know, different learning equivalents. And so you're addressing all of that. Um, through mentoring and, and peer coaching and um, the newsletters. And, you know, one of the things I wanted to touch on with you too, go into a little more detail, is about how you're addressing mental health support for your organization, your clinicians. Wow, okay. Um, I think we put that, um, that's a great question because we really put mental health out front and center. So early on when I joined in Genovis, um, that was one of our, our first and foremost, something that we would always continue. And you can see that that's evident in um, our programs that we create. So some of the tools that we offer, the mindfulness app that we have been able to partner with Amacare, and they have a mindfulness app that's amazing. It, it also offers clinician burnout modules, um, continuing education to our providers. Um, and it's it's a great tool for several reasons. Um, number one, it addresses the clinician burnout, yes, but then it's a mindfulness tool that you can pull out for a situation. Um, it has a different situational aspects. Um, so if you have challenges with the patient, there's actually a, maybe a meditation that's maybe one to two minutes in there for that. There may be a mindful practice if you have, um, maybe there's a death of a family member, or maybe you have to give bad news to a patient um, or uh, news that you don't you know, feel comfortable delivering. So it's really nice to be able to provide that tool as well as mobile, um, mobile mental health support. And so circles like clinician circles. Um, we do partner with Operation Happy Nurse. Um, I think you and I, we've discussed that. It's a wonderful mobile tool for our clinicians to be able to um, talk in peer-to-peer -peer circles. Um, there's also peer-to-peer -peer circle circles in Amacare app. Um, we also have our webinars and our first webinar, which I, we had in January of this year, was on mindfulness. So we're bringing in speakers um, who are experts in their field on different topics that 
can help with self-care and mental health support. So someone spoke on mindfulness. Um, there's been someone on leadership. Um, sleep is really important. We have a webinar on sleep. Um, and so we're, we're addressing that. And then we also have mental health support tools. Um, we make sure that they, in their toolkit, that they get, there's all the hot, hotlines that they need. They can contact our, our clinician engagement partner or myself if they feel that they're stressed or they need mental health support. We also have an EAP program, which we readily share with them. And and that's also, they can, it's a one-to-one -one support network where they can actually get the help that they need and not get just um, pushed place to place, but they can actually speak to someone and say, hey, this is what I need. And they get actually what they need. So we're making sure that we're putting these tools back in front of the clinicians. I know that I, I mentioned it before, um, but one of the things that I didn't have was just those reminders or that support or that advocacy when I was in the field, when I was frontline. And I guess I'm still frontline. I still see patients, but I'm not at the bedside in a health system. That can be really stressful. And so making sure that you have someone who can remind you, they can put those tools in front of you. They can keep up with those things for you. That's, that's huge. And I feel that that's what we're doing. Um, and that's, that's been, I think just on a different level for so many clinicians. It really is, Robin. I'm glad that you brought that up because I think it sounds like, you know, some of your nurses may be working on the front line at a hospital that maybe doesn't have peer coaching on the front line. Um, however, it sounds like you've implemented that within your own organization. So your nurses or clinicians always have somebody they can talk to if they need to reach out <clears throat> and they don't feel alone. You know, that's the thing is, you know, I know we're trying to move in the right direction of mental health support and checking in on each right. other, but I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, it's it's far from where it needs to be nationally in terms of uh, being standardized on the front line. So I think that's great that you are promoting mental health awareness and giving people tools to sort of self triage. And right. you know, I think sometimes, you know, we it's a perspective. It's it's a matter of, you know, I'm not trying to minimize the trauma on the front line right now. But I think I right. think that having a growth mindset and having a perspective of, you know, the different viewpoints of a situation can also make a difference and allow your mind racing to slow down and kind of <laughs> allow you to take a moment and get through your shift right. and process um, right. it makes a big difference. It is. I think sometimes you need another voice. You need someone to, to put it in perspective for you is, you know, i I may feel really heightened and excited about a situation. And then I, I talk to someone and they're like, you know what? I think it's this. And sometimes they need that too. Um, and you know, when, when we're, when we're providing this, this support, um, it's not that they may not have the support within the different hospitals that, that we, that they're going to, but we want to make sure we don't want it. We want to take the guesswork out of it and make sure that we are providing them everything that they need for that resilience. Um, because at the end of the day, they're taking care of patients. So we want to make sure that patients are safe, that they feel safe. And it's been a huge, it's, it's just been a, a deal changer for everyone. Um, what I like most about the ACT program is that it's constantly evolving. So um, we have to sometimes just slow down and say, wow, we're doing this, but there's so many other things that we want to do. Let's take a look at this. And then let's plan out what we want to, how we want to implement these other things. But that just reminds me of the need. The need is so great for, you know, that clinician burnout tools and support for, um, you know, career pathing for opportunity. A lot of them are so busy. They don't have time to look at that growth mindset or find those professional development opportunities. And we may be able to offer that to them or to show them and guide them on, on how to accomplish those different things that they want to, to get to the next step in their career. Well, yeah. And I mean, I think that's really important, Robin, because that provides hope and knowing that, you know, you're not stuck in a situation, especially if it's not something that's in alignment with where you are in your life. And so, there's always other opportunities or there's different ways of advocating for yourself within your own organization. And I think that training and education is key in working on retention of, of um, clinicians. 
it. Um, it's, I think when you take a step back and I know you've, you've done this too, because thank you for doing this podcast. I mean, you're doing a lot. I'm, I've seen you talk to other people. It's great. But when you take a step back and you, you put your, your eyes on advocacy, mm -hmm. you start to think of all the things you wish you knew. And that builds this huge program and platform on support and helping others and giving them these tools. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I what I've noticed and what I remember is I may have been given a couple of tools along the way. Mentorship, going back to what you said, was huge for me. Um, that was one tool that was really huge, just finding a mentor and setting on that. But for, to keep these tools in front of me. I didn't have that. So maybe I'd be introduced to something or I know that we have an EAP, but then I, I wasn't told further down the road, hey, this is still here for you. And I think we all need those reminders in this in the current climate and environment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm really glad that you brought that up because, you know, I think as, especially as physicians, I know that we're trained, you know, once we graduate from residency, we're on our own. Mm -hmm. And the idea of having a mentor and having a coach is sort of a newer uh, cultural phen phenomenon. And I know for me that it's been life changing to have that mentoring and coaching in my career. And um, I think that also goes to supporting mental health as well. I, I agree. And um, so we definitely are, we foster mentorship and we, act as mentors in our own way and advocates for our clinicians as well. But we definitely were working to develop that mentorship alignment within our ACT program so that clinicians can kind of support each other and they can help each other. They don't have to hear it from us. They can hear it from each other and they can, you know, kind of talk to someone in their peer circle that's walked in their shoes. Um, so it's, it's really above and beyond to think that you, you, you'll you get through your career without being touched by mentorship in some way. And I, I think we all will be, or we all have been. Absolutely. And I think that helps to break down the mental health stigma when we have peer coaching and mentoring. I think that's definitely um, <clears throat> part of the cultural transformation that, that I really like to highlight um, because, you know, not everyone that is experiencing burnout has depression. Not everyone has post-traumatic stress, you know, or has that kind of reaction to trauma. So it's really about triaging and, and seeing what each individual really needs moving forward. And I think that's where mentoring and coaching can come in. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Robin, this has been such a great discussion and I wanted to give you an opportunity as you know, is there, are there any last words of wisdom that you want to leave with our audience or anything else that you want to, to say that we didn't touch on? Well, you know, um, I think we've touched on quite a bit. Um, so Dr. Cole, thank you for having me. Um, just making sure that they under, they can reach out to me if they have questions about Ingenivus Act Program. I'm, I'm definitely open to talking about this more. And just it's important for them to take care of themselves, especially clinicians on the front line. Um, and some like myself, I don't consider myself a frontline clinician, but I am seeing patients and I, and I see them daily. And you're always affected, whether it's through speech or conversation or situations. So even when you don't think you need that that support or that connection, I think it's better to have it and to know that it's there for you and understand it than to, to not have it. So we're really excited about the ACT program. We're hoping to support and as many clinicians as possible through what we're doing. Um, we also have an Ingenivus Health Scholarship Program. I wanna make sure that I mentioned that before we end. Um, $100,000 in scholarships. So 25K scholarships that are out there for for you know, clinicians to apply to. And these are nursing scholarships. Um, and there are four different categories for these scholarships. There's a veteran scholarship. Um, there's an RN to BSN uh, scholarship. We have a scholarship as a memorandum for um, uh, Sean Loring, um, who was uh, one of our executive leaders who passed away. Um, and so that's that's our ASN scholarship, and that's out there, as well as a graduate nursing scholarship. Those applications are open through November, and um, 
they'll be awarded at the end of the year so that they can utilize those fees, those funds for spring. So um, if they're looking, that's just another tool and that's an outreach. There's um, nothing except you have to be a student in one of those criteria for the program to apply. So um, the university network is, um, they're, they're taking care of those scholarships for us. They're our third party, um, but please it, share as widely as possible. We definitely wanna make sure that we are um, contributing to retaining clinicians and also attracting new clinicians into health into health healthcare. So, um, excuse me, but really excited to talk to you today. <clears throat> and thank you for having me. And um, it's been great. Well, Robin, I just want to say thank you so much for being on the podcast today. We really appreciate you and your organization and what you're doing for clinicians nationwide. And you're really on the forefront of, you know, implementing well-being programs and different ways of communication, mentoring, peer coaching, everything we've talked about. I think you're right on track with what you're doing. And for all of you listening, I will have all of Dr. Geiger's links on her bio web page. And we will have everything available to you as well. And if you have any questions, we'll have Dr. Geiger's email and information to reach out to as well. So thank you all for attending and listening in today. And I look forward to seeing you all soon. Take care.